right? Oh, and then uh, David Warren, who's with our time with the Extension Foundation and also at OSU, will uh, provide some updates on the activities that perhaps many of you have contributed your resources to uh, with our Extension Bot and other things in the artificial intelligence area. So go ahead, Sandy, to the reminders on the next slide. So again, this is a uh, of ECOP by ECOP for ECOP event. So uh, we aim to have informational meetings once a month and our ECOP committees help to organize the content of these. All right, next slide. And you can engage either by raising your hand or dropping information into the chat that we'll watch for if you have questions. And then of course the information will be shared out uh, through Bill's uh, Monday Minute email. All right, next slide. Okay, so since our uh, March in-person ECOP meeting, just a few reminders of some of our changes in personnel. So these are often uh, generally your, your counterparts and ECOP um, well, around the uh, around the country. So our new new uh, and or returning ECOP members for Brent and Tom, it's a return to ECOP. Brent will be serving as the alternate to the policy board of directors. Tom uh, had been continuing to serve on the Journal of Extension uh, board and the IPM coordinating committee. So we welcome Brent, who's now in California back, and Tom Dobbins at Clemson. And then we welcome new Andy Turner, who's at Cornell, and he will be serving on the Professional Development Committee. We've also had two changes in our standing committees. So Lisa uh, stepped up with uh, Laura Perry Johnson's retirement to serve on the program committee. And then Carl Martin as uh, Ken LaValle changed roles at University of New Hampshire has stepped up to be the chair of the Professional Development Committee. And so we thank them for their leadership. I know they've been active uh, the past couple of months and will be uh, leading their committees in some work at our upcoming summer leadership meeting. The other appointment that's been made is Amanda Marney as our Eden liaison. And next slide. So I organized uh, the update to align with our uh, federal and, well, for our action plan that was established at our NIDA meeting last fall. And so that's the way I developed kind of my thinking to share with you. So again, since March, there's been a variety of activities that have con continued on the capacity funding um, initiative. And so you'll recall that Bev Durgan at Minnesota leads that, but there's also for the extension section, but there's also a broader APOU effort that we've been an active participant in. And so uh, Bev is one of the tri chairs that includes George Smith from Ag Bio Research, uh, well, the Ag Innovation Group, the Experiment Station Directors. He's at Michigan State, Moses Cairo from University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Rich Bonanno also serves on that along with Ray McKinney and, and Jason Henderson. And so APLU um, has uh, been organizing a variety of initiatives associated with that. And so they have, have I think as of this week, contracted with a group to assist in those efforts. And I think I heard that you might expect a very brief survey to help inform that uh, inform that that process. And so initially the aim was to have some new materials developed by Carrot next year. And I think with the current budget discussions and interest in uh, informing those sooner rather than later, that the aim is to have more materials developed prior to the Carrot meeting in February. And so again, if you get a survey, please uh, respond to that. So the ECOP portion of that group will continue our discussion at APLU. There was a session at the PILD meetings that Bev led, and then there will be what we think will be a facilitated session on 
the 18th at our summer leadership meeting to continue our efforts there. I listed PILD here just more generally as a another means that we have of expanding, uh, well, informing people about the need for expanded uh, resources. And so PILD, you, you uh, know, is aimed at uh, leaders throughout the system. So we send, for example, a variety of our, our county personnel as well as uh, district personnel to that. And so they have congressional office visits there that I think are impactful in sharing how uh, federal funding impacts them and, and uh, supports them in their jobs. Primarily through uh, Bill's sharing of Monday Minutes, there's also increased and continuing efforts on making sure that everybody's aware of competitive, competitive program opportunities. And so, so I see a variety of those listed there from women, infants, and children, uh, collaborations with Office of the Chief Scientist on food loss and food waste, as well as the EXCITE program. All right, so next slide. So the other uh, second, I guess, kind of plank in our, our uh, action plan is increasing the visibility and recognition of the Cooperative Extension Service as a, as a go-to place for education and research-based information. So Bill and um, uh, Rich were part, uh, Rich Bonanno were part of the National Coalition for Food and Ag Research in CFAR's annual meeting at Fly-In. And I think each of them had four different congressional visits associated uh, with that. So I know that uh, one of Bill's stops included Representative Lucas from Oklahoma and Miller from Illinois. So there are a variety of offices that were visited there, again, to raise our visibility. And there have been a variety of other meetings with uh, leaders in both commodity groups as well as in other agencies. And so I know that Doug and Bill met with Zippy Duval from the American Farm Bureau. And we, uh, you can see the others listed there. So Under Secretary of Ag, uh, Bill, no, Robert Bonney, uh, was one of the offices visited. There have been contacts and conversations with EPA. Uh, you see communications about NON, the National Association of Ag Advisors Network through Bill's Monday Minutes and then both Doug and Bill were part of a, a Pew Foundation's uh, uh, Symposium on Fostering Public Impact Research. So appreciate, again, the representation that we have in the conversations that we continue to have with a variety of people on behalf of, of this section. All right, next slide. So, uh, a third action item is identifying ongoing and emerging priorities and needs and, and mechanisms for collective actions. So I think one of the big um, initiatives in this area that you've heard about and read about, if you were on one of our earlier ones, we had a, a brief update about the uh, Climate Program Action Team's efforts. And so we are now in the final phases of that MOU development between the Climate Hubs, ECOP, Ag Innovation, and the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. So that's going to lead, I think, to better communications, as well as opportunities to jointly develop and deliver science-based, also region-specific information to our uh, many stakeholders and audiences. So I listed the salary survey here because, again, many of you contributed to that and it continues to help inform things like our capacity initiative. So on a call yesterday with Lewis Burke and Associates, um, Bill was uh, 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 re reminded them that we had data that showed that 91% of our county educators and 94% of our campus-based faculty are supported at least in part by federal funds. And so, uh, they thought that was uh, great information to have, to, again, to be able to share with congressional staff and congressional leaders so that they understand the importance of capacity. Other things that we continue to monitor and to work on, uh, some of you will have seen that there's public language now on the House version. Well, let me first go to the policy on national and multi-state events. So 
the program leaders working group together with NIFA, with ECOPS 4-H program leader and ECOP are uh, have a work in progress for a uh, an understanding of the uh, responsibility for risk management associated with events that are marketed as multi-state and national. So uh, watch for upcoming uh, additional information about that. Uh, but then the, the next, the final item on the list is the House Bill version uh, of language associated with Reprotecting the name and emblem of 4-H is public, so you can see that. So it's continuing to be monitored for any, uh, I I'd say, new nuances compared to what we've had in the past that may arise. So, you know, it's not a done deal, and we continue to look for opportunities to regain that protection that might be separate from the farm bill. So, uh, again, we're glad to see some movement on that and hope that there will be resolution um, with the farm bill, if not before on that. All right, next slide. Supporting the professional success of, C of our, our leaders is the, the final uh, item in our uh, strategic plan. And so we do that in a variety of ways that I hope are very familiar with you to you, which is includes the first Friday sessions like the one today, but also includes the Monday minutes that Bill shares out. Um, I'll just remind you that our Excellence and Extension Extension Diversity Awards process is underway. Uh, so hopefully each of you uh, had one or more, one an, a nominee for each of the categories from your institution for those. We look forward to celebrating those winners um, uh, later, later this year. And then of course we've got Nita uh, plans underway for September. We've got details about that on our final slide today. So I think that's it for updates. Are there any questions that I might be able to answer? Uh, yes, okay. So thank you. Sandy's also a key part of getting the Monday Minute out. Sandy's a key part of a lot of things with ECOP. So thank you for that. Any questions or anything I may have overlooked that somebody else wants to share? So again, we appreciate the efforts of many of you serving in different capacities on different committees and in conversations at uh, different levels for us. So not seeing any hands raised or questions. So um, I'll also just remind you that uh, there's been information shared out about uh, upcoming coffee chat with uh, NIFA, so LGU to you. That information, at least for me, was shared out through our regional associations. I hope you also received it. And if your schedules permit, that you'll, you'll take part in that because again, ongoing uh, good communications with NIFA and collaborations with them are important to ensuring that we're all on the same page with respect to uh, raising the visibility of the cooperative extension section. All right, thanks. Well, with that, I'm excited to hear some updates from David about the artificial intelligence work going on within an extension set. All right, sounds great. Uh, thank you very much, Donna. And I will go ahead and share my screen, I hope. If I can share the correct screen, there we go. Okay, um, so I think in conversations or exchanges with Sandy and Bill, we talked about me doing to talking about uh, the extension bot project, but also giving a little bit of information about basics of AI for the group. So I'm going to just hit a few slides of that and then uh, move forward. So. Uh, so for this group, I probably don't have to explain the Extension Foundation, I assume. Um, so uh, I uh, spend about a third of my time working with the Extension Foundation as AI program leader. And then uh, sort of the rest of my time, I'm, uh, I'm working with uh, NOSU Agriculture as the Senior Director of in uh, Integrated Digital Strategies. I'm also an adjunct professor teaching web analytics at NOSU in the School of Business. 
and uh, I spent most of my career uh, working in private industry, uh, like running digital businesses and digital product development for uh, web platforms and you know online tools, that sort of thing. So, Let's see, by way of a quick introduction here. Okay, so I uh, really, as I said, I've got two topics here. Um, and there we go. Okay. <clears throat> so one definition that I like of artificial intelligence, if we start talking about some basics of AI, is any technology that exhibits facets of human intelligence. So that's a very broad one, but, you know, there's a lot of, all the definitions sort of revolve around um, you know, technology that emulates or attempts to simulate, you know, human level intelligence. Um, and uh, you see the, uh, uh, by the way, this is a AI generated uh, image here. I asked uh, Dolly to, I gave it the text for this, uh, for this uh, slide and it gave me this image. Dolly is the uh, image generator owned by OpenAI who also owns ChatGBT. So um, just a little bit of background about AI in general. It's a field that's been around since the 50s. Uh, the term artificial intelligence was coined way back in, I think, 53 approximately. Uh, but in general, it's, as we talked about earlier, any technique that enables machines to mimic human behavior. Essentially, that's an alternate, you know, sort of description to the one I just provided before about, about AI. So essentially any technology you're trying to develop that emulates uh, a facet of human intelligence, well, that's largely AI. So since the late 60s, I think, the, a subfield of machine learning has become sort of the predominant area of uh, AI. And machine learning is sort of exactly what it sounds like. It's where statistical methods are used to effectively predict uh, answers or um, paths to make uh, uh, for questions without being explicitly programmed to them. So it's not a set of rules where you say, if A, then do B, that sort of thing. It's uh, essentially you give it a whole uh, a tool, a whole lot of data, and it learns from that. So, uh, so that's a, machine learning is a subfield of AI, the most important subfield of AI currently. And then since I think the 90s, there, uh, there's been a uh, field of machine learning called neural networks. And deep learning is actually one area of neural networks where you have essentially levels of neural networks talking to each other. And neural networks are designed to be a simulation to some degree of the human brain. Uh, and they actually have entities within them that are called neurons, and they're trying to essentially, to some degree, as I said, mentioned, emulate the way that we think. So that's deep learning neural networks is the most important field of AI and has been since at least 20 years. Uh, if anybody remembers Deep Blue, it was, I think, the first chess program to beat the world, human world chess champion. And since then, uh, AI programs have... Uh, basically become truly dominant in that field, as in the best uh, humans can never beat the best uh, or uh, the best computer programs in chess. So uh, hold on to that thought for just a second. So I'll go back into deep learning neural networks here in just a moment. Okay, so when we talk about facets of human intelligence, that's what you don't have to read all the description on the slide too much, but there's nine different facets of human intelligence that are measured here, and they're measuring performance of the, the best AI tools in each of those facets. And these are things like visual reasoning, uh, language understanding, uh, mathematics, that sort of thing. And with a dotted line at the top being a uh, human baseline. Uh, and I put a little target there, a bullseye over on the right, right, where, where approximately where 2024 would be. And you can see that the trends are all up and to the right towards the bullseye. That uh, at least of these nine that are being measured, and this is from a Stanford report. Stanford has the Human Centered AI, um, uh, I think it's Institute. And this is a great report that they put out every year. And I include some links at the end, which you guys won't when you get the slides can click over and read that. I encourage you to read at least the first page of that report. It's plain English and lays out, I think, a top 10 or 12 for things to know about AI right now. Uh, it's really good. So, but the key point of this slide is that 
of the things that we're measuring that AIs can do uh, that are you know human-like sort of facets of intelligence, they're all at or achieving or close to achieving human level intelligence. Now, some of that you can take a, a, with a bit of a grain of salt because if you use say chat GPT or others, you know, the writing, for example, sometimes isn't great. And it also runs into a problem called hallucinations, uh, which I'll get to in just a second. I've got a slide about hallucinations. So. Okay. So, um, but, you know, AI has sort of just taken off in recent years and become sort of a, a sort of cultural phenomenon as well as a really important thing technically. Um, you can see here, this is another slide from the same Stanford report that clearly something happened around 2017 or 2018. Um, there's uh, where so the number of patents filed annually for AI globally has gone from you know a few thousand to tens of thousands per year. And what happened was uh, there was a paper written in 2017 that uh, essentially put forward the notion, uh, a notion called transformers, which is a new architecture for a type of deep learning neural network that I mentioned before. So transformers are what's behind almost everything that you hear about these days in terms of AI. Um, they It's what is behind chat GPT or its algorithm, which is GPT, GPT-4, which stands for, I think, generative, uh, generative pre-trained transformer is what the T stands for there is transformer. Um, as well as all of its competitors, they're all using the same base software in there to some degree, which is uh, the core of it is this transformer. So not to get too deep into that particular paper, but if you want to look it up, I've got a slide about it in the slide deck. It's called Attention is All You Need. It was written by eight researchers at Google. Um, but the key things that this new software enables that the previous neural network's not able to do is it's better at understanding context. So that's why the writing makes a lot more sense than the stuff you saw before. It also enables parallelization, which means that um, the software can not process serially uh, or content serially, serially as the previous neural networks did. It can do many of them at once which enables them to, uh, to be much faster and more efficient, and also lets them take uh, advantage of some of the new hardware that's out there that is also able to process in a parallel manner. So the speed and efficiency lets it also incorporate huge amounts of data. And this being able to incorporate this huge amount of data within these uh, software, within the transformers, uh, is, is what has been one of the major breakthroughs. And we're now up to billions and billions, hundreds of billions and approaching trillions of words being uh, in these uh, data sets for uh, these tools. Uh, the last thing that enables is because of their architecture, you can have so-called large context windows. And the context window is essentially the, the your prompt. It's how much space you had to put in a prompt. It used to be pretty small. But now they're getting to be, say, this bigger than, say, a novel length. Uh, and while none of us are going to write that much text to, for a prompt, it allows programmers to do some things I'll show in a minute uh, that we're doing on it with, with extension bot to go out and grab other content and uh, append that to your query when you make a query. So uh, we move on here. So resulting in, uh, so transformers that I just described, when you add those giant data sets and you run them on the, the new, newer hardware, which is called GPUs, you're probably familiar with CPUs, which has kind of been traditionally the heart of, you know, uh, PCs and the, all the computers that you use. GPUs are a little different. They're graphic processing units and started out just as a video cards or those of us who in the past might have built, uh, you know, gaming PCs. Well, that's kind of what runs the whole video enterprise of it. It turns out that those are massively parallel and are able to process are able to process data for AI really fast. The perfect thing for running AI. Um, so you bring these three things together, and you have what's now called a large language model. And you've probably heard that term in reference to ChatGPT and other tools. You also may have heard the term generative AI. People, when they use generative AI. AI and LLMs are usually talking about the same thing, 
the little differences generative AI really just means the creative aspect of being able to create new text and images and audio and video, which some LLMs can do all those things now. Okay, last here sort of definition I'm gonna talk about um, around uh, AI is hallucinations. So hallucinations are sort of right now still one of the biggest drawbacks of using large language models. And uh, it's essentially the tendency of these tools to make things up. Um, by the way, this is this image, all these images in the background are AI generated, or I took the text that I'd written for each of these images and put them in a program and had to say, just told it to give me an image. So this is what uh, Dolly, which is one of the biggest generators, uh, thinks that a hallucination should look like. Uh, it's kind of a cool, anyway, cool background image. But um, yeah, so hallucinations are one of the biggest problems with AI now. And it's something we've taken a series of steps in the extension bot project to actually avoid and limit. Okay, so now I'm going to go into extension bot. By the way, I'm, I will keep an eye on the chat or maybe Robin, uh, maybe somebody in the audience, Bill or Sandy can, uh, if there's any questions, they feel free to, to uh, call those out. So. Let me uh, click somewhere. Should, there we go. Okay, so talking about extension bot. First, I'll talk about a little bit of the background. Um, this is actually a few points that I extracted from a pa recent paper from the Journal of Extension. It was written by Paul Hill and um, um, I, I, who uh, is from Utah State, and then uh, L.K. Nareen, I believe she's from Maryland, um, about implication of generative AI on extension. And uh, their key points are around here that we should expect to use AI. We should gain increased efficiency within extension, but also expect some impacts like job displacement. So um, here is where we think that uh, extension bot can actually have an impact as we, we first of all, we don't believe that AI, that uh, extension bot will replace anybody, but we think it will help us get more efficiency it will help us reach more people and answer without hiring a bunch of people. Um, and it could also help improve the extension or the education offered, say, by uh, our extension educators to help them make better presentations or make presentations faster, for example. Um, there's also some key points they make in this paper, which I've got a link to as well in the slides uh, around ethical considerations. We'll get to that in a minute. I would also say that um, um, AI is clearly going to impact us uh, and that if we want to deal with it, we need to make some money available. And that would be in terms of people whose job it is to help utilize uh, the existing AI technology uh, and to apply it to fields that are important for extension. Um, and lastly, there's a point in the paper they talk about, is, it a, is AI an ex existential threat to the extension service? Personally, I don't think so, because if you think about what AI does, uh, it's not going to physically go out and you know make presentations to farmers in a field or uh, or really effectively organize a 4-H meeting or anything like that. However, there are things that it could help and make more efficient. The key thing here um, is, and this is, I'm not talking about an extension bot here. I, I, I want to drop to this slide. This is actually from the World Economic Forum in the end of last year. And there, with their, uh, uh, this is a great report, by the way, I've linked to that here as well. Um, and they take into account the impact of AI, expected impact of AI over the next five years. You look on the right here, the top 10 fastest declining jobs. They basically, if you have any job that has the word clerk in it or secretary or admin assistant, they expect those jobs to be impacted heavily. So in terms of, uh, of extension, I know we have a lot of um, admin assistants, say, in, um, in county offices in a lot of places. So those are the areas where uh, not extension bot, but other, other potential AIs would could potentially impact and um, that we have to, you know, pay attention to is this, you know, is this something we want to do? And if so, you know, can we make, take advantage of some efficiencies while also, uh, caring for these people, right? 
And so that's what this slide talks about, ethical, ethical considerations. Uh, a key is what happens to anyone whose jobs are displaced? Are we going to make a plan for those? Uh, and, you know, I can't say that this is going to happen tomorrow, but certainly in the next three to five years, there's going to be some impacts. Um, so also things we need to watch out for when we're using AI, like uh, especially an extension bot where we're developing the AI, um, bias training sets and bias in our algorithms are, are potential issues. Uh, just as an example, like uh, we have right now, our data set and extension bot is predominantly from uh, 1862s. We just have a few uh, 1890s in, in our data set. Um, and we don't have any tribal universities at all yet, but we hope to soon. Um, so we want to make sure that we're uh, developing a corpus of data that lets us be balanced and uh, fair in the way that all of our uh, questions are answered. Um, I also dropped here to those last one. I added this. This is, again, an extract from, from uh, Paul Hills and Noreen's uh, paper. <clears throat> Liability is something that's been brought up in some discussions. The liability of one or two old, uh, answers, you know, is a potential concern. And then also the trust in the public if we're, if we don't get it right. Our trust from the public for extension if we don't get the, our use of these tools right, it is something to also consider. Um, I am not an attorney, but I would say our liability in say using AI tools is probably not that much to, to answer questions, for example, is not that much different from our liability if a human answers them. In the end, if we're providing answers, they need to be right, right? Okay. So uh, about five years ago, um, uh, the Prior CEO of the Extension Foundation, Chris Guy, uh, and I were chatting, and we talked about a, a, a few things, which was sort of where is the behavior of the public now, right? And, uh, you know, we can see that uh, there's about 2 billion Google searches a day in the U.S., and the average American adult spends more than eight hours a day in front of screens, uh, mostly, you know, phones and laptops, that sort of thing. And also that uh, all 112 exchange services have websites and sort of constituencies that use those websites. So you bring all those things together. And by the way, all those data sets across all those websites, all their content, um, you know, we talk about, can, is there something that could be built to serve the public better? Um, and what we came up with, and then we formed an actual team committee from 11 different extension services to work on this. Uh, was the idea of a chatbot, an AI chatbot, be able to have plain English interactions with the public as well as extension educators and volunteers. So here's just then uh, some uh, sort of quick overview of the project overall. So it, it, the project, which eventually became to be called Extension Bot, there's really two pieces. One, we gather data, we gather content from extension services. And right now we have content from 23 extension services in our repository uh, with a couple more that are requests that we uh, are in the process of working on. Uh, we have built an AI powered chatbot. By saying we built, um, we are using open source software. We're using a chatbot right now called from a company called Mistral. Um, but we are also looking at switching to another one from Meta or Facebook called Llama3. Um, so the project is uh, sponsored by the Extension Foundation. Uh, we have a, a third-party AI development company we work with called EduWorks. And then, of course, also um, all the extension services that we work with, uh, we're working to get this together, funded by the NTAE, gr NTAE grant from NIFA. We do have an advisory board that was formed that is composed of the uh, member institutions who sort of started on the project initially. There's five that are part of it right now. Um, the focus is on extension educators, be able to answer questions from them first, and volunteers such as master gardeners who often answer questions from the public, particularly because when we focus on those people first, uh, we think you know that they, they have a little bit of knowledge and can help us sort of vet the answers initially. Um, and then after that, the public more fully for all, in all areas of extension. Um, essentially, the topical areas in which the tool can answer questions 
is, is essentially anything that we have content for, right? So any extension relevant question. Uh, it is in what we call beta release right now, which means it's publicly available with a disclaimer on it saying, uh, please, you know, this, this tool works pretty well, um, but we're putting it out there to get further interaction with the public and see if we can find areas in which, which need further work. Um, there's no charge for an extension service to use extension bot. And like I said, we're up to about 26 uh, institutions that have wanted to take part in this. So uh, I'll just give you some quick examples. So I ran the same search with the current version of chat uh, GPT, which is why are there brown spots in my Bermuda grass? Because there are brown spots in my Bermuda grass. Uh, and then I ran the same one in extension bot. And you can see um, we, we get pretty good answers in both cases. Um, however, um, some differences here that I'll point out is that ChatGPT does not offer references. So ChatGPT does not have a live con connection to the web, except in some, uh, there's an exception, but we won't need to go into that right now. But generally when you use ChatGPT, it's working off data that's probably, uh, that they stopped pulling data from the web about a year ago. Um, whereas we have a way to access live data or nearly live data, as in, as recently as we've pulled it into the system, which could be anything for anywhere from last week to a few months ago. Um, so you can see within our answer here, we, we've we referenced it and we're telling you where those, you can click on, those are all clickable links and you can click on that and go to that reference document, which is in most cases a fact sheet. We also try to localize the answer. So if we know which website this uh, question is coming from, in this case, the, uh, widget or the tool that's embedded is embedded on the Oklahoma State Extension website. We know that this is from Oklahoma, so we can incorporate that into the answer. Uh, and also, because it's this tool is loaded with extension content, it does things such as referencing soil testing um, and you know uh, and other things that are loaded into its corpus of data. And lastly, you can see we have provided uh, links below here. Since this tool, so I was asking this question from an Oklahoma website, it gave me mostly Oklahoma answers along with, I think, an Alabama answer there at the bottom. Um, and we also have added this feature where we ask follow-up questions uh, to help person dig deeper or the user dig deeper into a particular topic. And just to talk about localization, I then have I, I, the question is slightly different, but it's more or less the same. Why do I have dead spots in my Bermuda grass? I asked the question uh, from the Oklahoma chatbot, and then I also asked the Florida version. And you can see that the the answer is pretty similar, uh, but the references are very different. And that's because we created a way for each state to wait. Uh, their content versus everybody else's content. Uh, you can actually, there's three tiers. You can you can say, I want my answers first, and then potentially a list of uh, states, uh, answers from states around you, potentially if you want to do that. And then lastly, you can say, then if I don't get an answer for one of those, I want it from other places. Uh, and you can see that I've got the waiting set pretty high, pretty high right now for Oklahoma, where you're really only seeing, you're seeing mostly Oklahoma content, whereas the Florida setup, they haven't, uh, adjust the weightings very much yet. And you can see that, uh, look at those links down there, they're getting answers uh, or sources from Clemson and North Carolina and so forth from other places, including Oklahoma. All right, so uh, this is really an important slide in this whole, whole discussion. You don't need to understand anything about that diagram below. I just wanna point out a few key things. So. One of the keys that we focused on early on from our uh, from our steering committee that helped us develop the ideas around um, around extension bot is that this thing had to be trustworthy, and we focused most on that above everything else. We can't have hallucinations, or you know, we had a bare minimum have to have very very few. So uh, we focused on this by 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 handling this. We came up with four uh, strategies to deal with uh, hallucinations. One is the so-called fact-based network. All the content within uh, the corpus of content within our database that we use to answer questions is from extension services. There's a little bit from USDA and we may do more of that, 
as well, depending upon the desires of our uh, steering committee or of our, I'm sorry, advisory committee. But um, we don't have, say, content from Reddit or Quora or other social networks, right? So that's a big deal. There's some, um, there, all the big networks have that sort of thing built into them, uh, or all the big large language models, and uh, we don't. So, um, therefore, if we know an answer, it's coming from someplace based on research, right? So, two, um, hallucinations most often occur where you have gaps or holes in content or where, where the so-called thin content because the, the system's trying to answer a question and if it doesn't find an answer, it can sometimes make that answer up. So what, a strategy we developed was instead of trying to do uh, chat bots state by state, that if we pooled all that content, we could minimize hallucinations because we have a lot more content. So in our corpus of content, we've got over 360,000 pages, say web pages or, you know, uh, PDFs, that sort of thing of content. Uh, any given uh, extension service is going to average probably a thousand or two thousand, maybe three or four thousand, right? Um, so that's something where by sharing our content together, we're able to make something that works a lot better than any of us could have had by ourselves. Thirdly, we focus uh, on on localization. So, um, so our answers are localized, the references are localized, so those links to fact sheets, for example, uh, and the branding's localized. So that's all a focus, again, to show that our content and our answers are, are trustworthy. And lastly, this fourth item is, a, is called RAG, uh, Retrieval Augmented Generation. This is a technical approach to make answers from LLMs more reliable and less prone to hallucinations. And this outline below shows sort of how that works. I've got a red rectangle around the LLM. Uh, and so that would be um, like chat GPT or uh, in our case, it's something called Mistral. So that is the LLM. All the stuff built around it is stuff that our team, our development team has built to uh, so that here's how it works. If you submit a question such as why are there dead spots in my Bermuda grass? Um, the query comes in, it gets transformed into numbers, and then it goes and tries to find similar queries or similar content in its so-called embedding model, which then goes into this, what's labeled there as a vector database called Curent. It goes and finds all these uh, references uh, from uh, all the content from all the extension services that we pulled in. And those are chunked up into pieces. So it's not an entire fact sheet. It's a section of a fact sheet within a certain distance of uh, that, that the system thinks is relevant, right? So it can be a page or let's say you have a header that, that's about a particular topic and then pull in all the paragraphs underneath it. So it grabs all that content. It sorts them for importance and relevance. And then along with your question of uh, why, why is what have dead spots in my Bermuda grass, it throws in all that other content with it that it knows or believes is similar or, or relevant to your question. So the LM gets not only it's, it's embedded training, but also all this content along with your question. And so what it produces is much better answers and uh, answers are much less likely to be hallucinations. Okay. So uh, I'm not going to drop this. Oh, let's see, I'm not. This isn't clickable for you guys. But if you want to right now, you can go to extension.org forward slash chat. That is where the uh, we have one version of extension bot. There, it is not localized at all. So it has all the content from 23 extension services in there, um, uh, as well as our history of Ask Extension, what used to be called Ask an Expert Questions. There's close to half a million questions in that database uh, of things people asked online and then were answered by an extension expert. So um, those are in that database as well. So if you'd like to go try that out, you're welcome to. Um, I'll give you just a second to pull that up. While I'm checking the messages here. There we go. Okay, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy.
Okay, so um, I'll, I'll mention a few things while you're probably hopefully trying that out. As I mentioned, our sort of initial focus uh, was, being, was being able to answer questions from extension educators and volunteers. And we think we did a pretty good job of that initially. Um, and it's already handling those questions pretty well. So now we're on to phase two, which is answering questions for the public, uh, which includes ag producers. However, this sort of third tier of answering questions is something that uh, we can only partially handle. When I say complex questions, another term for that is a uh, technical term is actually hard questions. And large language models deal in text primarily. They're not generally very good with numbers yet. So the complex questions I'm referring to there are if people ask questions such as uh, what 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 application rate should I use for fertilizer for my wheat field? Uh, you know, something along those veins. And if you have, you know, I know in Oklahoma, we've got fact sheet after fact sheet, there's giant tables full of numbers like that. The system doesn't do as good with those. It usually doesn't lie. It just does, tells you, it quite often says, I don't know the answer. Um, so uh, in particular, if you have a need to do something like uh, um, like in farm budgeting, where uh, you want to uh, say, I, I want to change this farm practice. Maybe in, in next year, instead of uh, planting uh, wheat in this field, I instead want to uh, plant alfalfa and graze it or something like that. What would be the potential impacts upon my uh, my cost and my profitability of my farm? That's not something that the LLM could answer right now well. it could, If you have text about that in a fact sheet, it could talk about it what are the considerations involved, but it couldn't actually do a calculation for you. If you said, I have 200 acres and whatever other the details are needed, it couldn't give you a number uh, that would be reliable. So um, there is a project and I'm working on a separate project in Oklahoma called BudgetBot, where we're actually working with a startup company in AI who's trying to actually bring those so-called deterministic capabilities in along with this, uh, the probabilistic capabilities of, uh, of LLM. Okay, I'm getting near the end here. Um, I'll just quickly mention that the steering com committee for Extension Bot helped us develop uh, a number of guiding principles, including we want to make sure that the chatbot's a way to connect into Extension and not just uh, as sort of a standalone thing. It needs to be localized, accurate, respectful privacy that needs to cite sources and respect provenance of uh, content. Um, Two key things to focus on here, I think, is uh, we know that extension offices are only open during business hours, typically, and often people need immediate answers. Um, so that's a great thing about having a chat body is it can be there 24-7, 365. It also is good at surfacing hidden content that often even doesn't show up in search engines very well. Okay, I talked about localization, and I'm going to just skip this We're again. Uh, running low on time. So some key points here, what we've learned uh, over the last few years, we've really been working on this current version of the spot for two years. Um, and it's clear that more data as we theorize equals better results. And that uh, the RAG approach I mentioned, along with our fact-based approach, does minimize hallucinations. Um, the only hallucinations I've been able to make it have are ones where we don't actually have content to cover them. Uh, and that's just been a few of those. Uh, most of our work's been around obtaining data. Uh, it's, so that's been a hard part of getting the data, getting the data clean uh, and into the system. Localization is really important as we expected. Things are changing very fast. Uh, the the GPUs to run the system on are expensive. Like uh, I think we're spending about $800 a month and we expect that to go up. And uh, that, while we have funding from NTAE for our current level, if usage continues to grow, um, more funding is going to be needed just to be completely open. Won't go into this too much other than we are, we've are we got a um, really good development schedule. There's a lot of things we're looking at and, and are working on. For instance, we're working on a Facebook, inter Facebook Messenger interface right now uh, into the extension bot. Uh, could, we could do other systems as well. We're going to be putting a new core large language model in the summer to improve the accuracy of results. Um, 
and um, we're working to automate data gathering right now as well. And there's a lot of other cool things we could do soon. So I'm going to skip to the end and say questions. Thanks, David. I'll ask one. So the things that people are contributing are text-based things, so publications from their websites. Is that is that right? So it's not going to find or link to, for instance, spreadsheet tools that people might have. So I'm I'm uh, glad you're working on things like the budget bot, but is there a way for it to find and reference things that might exist already? Yeah, so we are um, working on uh, some of those issues right now. So what to this point, the data that everyone has, has, has contributed is essentially fact sheets or articles and publications that are primarily text and orientation. Um, we're at this moment, we're actually doing a test poll of content from all the OSU Extension website. So we've got about a 6,000 page website, of which about 1,500, page, 1500 of them are uh, fact sheets. So we're grabbing everything else and we're putting it in a test environment. Uh, and we're then going to be testing how, how it does uh, on this other content. So we've got a lot of other text content, but including that is also a lot, a lot of sort of numerically oriented content. Um, secondly, we do have on our roadmap this ability to handle deterministic questions. Um, we just aren't there yet. I would expect sometime um, in, an, in six to 12 months time frame where we'd really be able to dig into that local deterministic questions issue. Um, and we'll pretty much be working alongside the budget bot folks, or at least learning from what goes on there. Uh, the system we discovered, at least the, 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 the approach that the AI company is using uh, with budget bot is it's sort of it is writing a lot of its code on the fly, like it's writing Python code as you when you ask the question, it's saying, well, I need to I need something else here to answer. And it sort of writes its own code and implements that code to actually get you the answer to some degree. There is some built in stuff where they're, they're emulating some of the things that's in those existing enterprise budget. Um, uh, you know, some of the, I'll say the visual basics of some of those things, but it's also sometimes generating code on the fly to do those. So that is forthcoming. We intend to do it. We just don't have it yet. Other questions okay. from David? Again, I always learn something. I appreciate your being on this afternoon. So thanks. I think it's exciting to see the the progress that's been made from just kind of pilot versions that we looked at. So Jason's got his mic on. Yeah, go. Um, so David, are there anything in particular that us as directors need to do to tell our staff when they put things on the web that would help, you know, uh, get this into the the bot program to synthesize it? And yeah. Various different things. Absolutely. So um, PDFs are hard, I can tell you. Um, we For us to pull in content from a website built full of, that just pull of PDFs is way more effort than for us to pull in just web pages. So the, the preferred situation is actually that your, your, all your content is in HTML in a content management system. Like we at OSU use something called Omni CMS. I know a number of you use it or use you know, other ones similar to it. Um, the ideal situation is that you have a system which you can just output content in the format we want, which is called JSON. So um, I'd be glad to talk to any technical people you want and provide them some of those details if they don't have them. Go, Charlie. Hey, uh, great. I was, you know, I was in the original E extension when we tried to do something like this, which was much more laborious. I mean, for a specialist, uh, uh, just envisioning um, as you do this, what type of analytics do you envision that you'll have with this? Because it'll be interesting to see 
how people across the U.S. use it. Are they accessing where are they coming from? I'm just kind of curious. Have you thought about the analytics side? Because every one of us, we have to locally, what's the impact? What's the impact we're making to our immediate stakeholders, those who are funding us? What do we tell them? Absolutely. Yeah, so we uh, that was one of the um, requirements from our original steering committee was to have, be able to offer uh, information from the, how, how are people using this. So every uh, extension service has a, a dashboard they can log into and see every question and the answer that's generated, as well as some information about the timestamp, how long it took, and a few other things. We have chosen not to include any uh, private information, so we're not at this point, including IP address, for example, we could, if we, you know, if we wanted an IP address is something you could use to locate the person, you know, the physically jogger uh, that, that could be added. But right now, you know, essentially which one of the, which one of your pages it came from more or less, uh, the question came from, um, and you know, that it came from your particular uh, website, for example. Um, and there's a little bit of basic ability to sort in that sort of thing in, in our dashboard, but what some other people are doing, let's say Lucas Turpin, if anybody, you know, him at Oregon State, he's taking that data, dumping it out, put it in Power BI, and he's doing all kinds of things with it. So we expect most of the analysis that might be in depth to occur in sort of other tools. Uh, but yeah, so uh, that's certainly all that data is available to each of the institutions. We have been talking about, actually, I... Um, I emailed Demona something about this last week that we might be interested in that some, some, there might be some people willing to happy to write papers to access this data uh, and analyze it and make some, uh, uh, you know, uh, make some, have some findings out of it. So we'd be happy to cooperate with people on that too. Thanks. Jason, you had another question. Yeah. Yeah. So when do you think this is going to be kind of, at a point that you're ready to really blast it out and that we need to all move it out to people in our organization. The second thing is, is will there be a development of a communications plan? Because uh, we have a lot of people in extension and how do we go about reaching them? Right. Um, so, we expect it to be sort of hopefully a point where we'd say this is full production, not beta test by the end of the year. Uh, what we need is a lot of usage, um, a lot more usage than we have right now. So that's the kit. So right now it's only publicly live as far as I know on the uh, Ford extension, uh, Oklahoma state extension and Oregon state extension websites. Um, so we're hoping to get more usage from a broader cross section of people um, to give us comfort that it's working well, right? I mean, I've, I, I, I put a lot, hundreds of questions in, right? But um, I'm, you know, so, but what we need is this broader usage to, to tell us where the problems are, if there are problems. And I can tell you, I know you know what the problems are. The problems are where we don't have much content. Uh, we had an area of honeybees, right? Where we it, it made up a little bit, made up a little bit of answer. It wasn't completely right, but it was kind of wrong. And we had a, a, in an area of HR in which we didn't have any data at all. Like a, I asked it a question, something like, a, um, I had somebody submit in our form on our OSU extension website, a question uh, that was something like, how do I report a problematic extension person? <laughs> right. Um, and I sent that on to the district director directly, but then I thought that'd be a good question to ask the bot. And it answered it pretty well with good text. But the problem is it can, it's it basically referred to Oklahoma and to Utah. And then I, so I figured it out in that when I went and looked at Utah's corpus of content, they actually had a fact sheet, which did talk something about personnel issues and extension. Um, so that's why it sort of got a little confused because we didn't have any answer in Oklahoma and I got the weighting set high enough where it kind of confused uh, for the bias towards Oklahoma data where it confused the two. So, so yeah, well, I think you'd invite anybody to do kind of what we've done, which is a soft rollout within extension. I mean, we described it, told our educators, ask it questions, and then we gave them a couple of months to try to do that, uh, encourage them to use it, provide feedback, and then we've done a soft launch more publicly. And so you can, any of you who've contributed and can see that it's got answers that 
seem appropriate for you might want to to start to do that. But I do think that's a good question, Jason, for us to think about uh, at the national level, because anytime we've mentioned this initiative, for instance, so like Lewis Spark, you know, it's something that sparks uh, interest because it's new and innovative and there are staffers and others that want to see that we're doing some things new and differently and where new investment dollars might go. All right, we're at our appointed time. So, well, I saw Ben had a question. I don't know, is that something quick or you want to follow up with David? I'll just follow up with David. Thanks, Tamara. Okay. Um, Sandy, I think you've got a, 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 a little survey that we regularly ask people if you don't mind providing some feedback. Again, we appreciate everybody's participation this afternoon. And again, thank David for uh, your presentation. So hope everybody's air conditioners are working well. We're anticipating 97 degrees tomorrow in Oklahoma. So hopefully you're not going to get quite that warm. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon.